Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new unto us every morning. And though we have not deserved your goodness, you abundantly provide for all our wants of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness toward us, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're in the book of uh, Galatians. As you can tell, I did something a little bit different with the color schemes of the presentation. Uh, hoping this shows up a little bit better on the video. Had some issues with a little bit of that. So uh, we'll, we're going to try this one a little bit better. Let's see if it does a little bit better. So we are actually... Uh, we're actually in the, uh, the fifth, I mean, it's letter E here. The first argument uh, about living as a justified person, uh, the uselessness of circumcision. And we're in the second part, which then says the law divides the community. Now, I, I do bring a lot of Luther into all of this, and you've been hearing some of this Luther quotes, and so let me pick up on an idea that Luther brings to all of this. I'm going to articulate it in a ball of sense, okay? Luther looks at this and says, wait a minute, the spirit unites us as a community, okay? And that's what God wants. He wants us to come together around God's word and sacrament, he wants us to support one another. He wants us to pray for one another, encourage one another, build each other up. Who doesn't want us to come together? That's Satan. And Luther is very quick to pick up as he was uh, lecturing about Paul's letter to the Galatians, is that these false apostles that were coming in that were disrupting things really did not have God's agenda at hand but really had Satan's agenda at hand. You gotta remember, even Jesus says to Simon Peter, get behind me, Satan, okay? And not that all of a sudden Simon Peter turned into a, a devil worshiper per se, but our, our sinful nature does not always have the things of God uh, as a priority. And sometimes we operate out of that sinful nature. So what Paul's gonna be teaching about in this uh, section uh, for a little bit is that the, the law, Okay, which does not save us, okay, uh, will actually then be dividing us as a community of believers. And so if you're really following the law and you're saying, this is how I'm going to be saved, you're not being saved by Christ. And again, <clears throat> who's behind this idea? Would Christ ever sit there and say, you don't need me? No. No. There's only one person that says, you don't need Christ. And it's not your pastor, okay? Uh, that comes from Satan. So uh, we're going to be focusing on how uh, the law divides the community, okay? So we're going to continue on with Galatians chapter 5, and we uh, left off, uh, we're picking up at, uh, I should say, at verse 10. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. Okay? And bottom line is, St. Paul is saying, yeah, there's going to be that last day, and there's going to be that day of accountability. And so notice that where I'm pairing this uh, with from Mark chapter 9, verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... It would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now, I chose this verse for a couple of reasons. First of all, in connection with uh, what St. Paul is trying to teach us, is that those who mislead people, okay, and misleading them away from Christ will bear that penalty on the last day. That will happen, okay? And, and so St. Paul is correct uh, that the one who was troubling you, the one that was dividing you, 
the one that was pulling you away from Christ and creating, stirring the pot so much you lost your focus on Christ, that person will bear the penalty. Okay. Now the second reason I wanted to bring in this Mark chapter 9 verse 42 is because of the use of the word little ones. Because typically when I've heard people use this passage, I've heard them say, well, little ones are referring to children. And fair enough, they are little ones. But notice that St. Paul is using this argument with the parents of those little ones, so to speak. Little ones basically mean, could mean anyone who is in the faith in reference to what Jesus is talking about. Yes, Jesus is concerned about children. Fair enough, and we should be concerned about children. We should be concerned that they get a proper Christian education. We should be concerned that they are loved and cherished in today's world, and they do need to be protected because they haven't grown and developed enough skills to protect themselves yet. By all means, we need to be protecting the children. But also there's a nuance into this in saying, let's not think of it as only children. Because now I'm going to use this as the, the flock of God, the community of believers. What happens if a disruptor comes in here and starts pulling you away from Jesus Christ? Will they not also be held accountable on the last day? And the answer is yes. And this is another reason why we are blessed in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod to have this structure that says we are going to train uh, professional church workers. We are going to certify them by a faculty that says, yes, they've got the right background and we think even the right mindset to be able to serve our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's a lot of churches that don't have the wonderful blessings of our seminaries and our, our uh, college system, university systems, to go ahead and provide these trainings. And sometimes they choose poorly, but at least there's some level of accountability for our professional church workers and our congregations within the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. So we are blessed because we do have to admit, just like St. Paul is trying to rebuild this community of believers, uh, and he had to write this letter to the Galatians, that some things don't change. We live in a world where sinners do get in and they try to divide the community of God. John, I think I saw your hand for a moment. Uh, is, are you also referring to people that humble themselves as the little ones? Yes, a any believer, yes. So, um, this is where, you know, in the church, wherever we raise up leaders, and this is also scripture brings us in, I just didn't bring this in the, the Bible passage to it, where yes, leaders are gonna be held a little bit more accountable and they should handle that weight and responsibility appropriately and not misuse it, okay? And this is where we need to have leaders that have good boundaries, because have we seen leaders with bad boundaries? Um, leaders that are very loving and caring, but yet at the same time also teaching God's Word. Because ultimately it is God's Word that saves, delivers, repairs us, forgives us, nurtures us. And so we need to have that Word of Christ continuing to go out. Okay, any other questions before we move to the next slide? Yep. Uh, isn't it that a lot of times it's believed that it's your first, I, I see what you're saying about little ones, because even in the Catholic Church, the priests say, my son, my daughter, you know, they call them that, so they, were, they treat them like the little ones. But um, in Scripture, wasn't it really, like, the picture that I always get when he's saying that is when there were children surrounding Jesus, and that's when he said that Scripture, and I think that's, that's where uh, the, my mindset right. always goes to the children. Yeah, and that, yeah, that was part of my, my explanation of this, uh, the verse, is that, yes, we, naturally our first reaction would be to, again, protect those children. So I don't want to take them out of the loop. I just want to expand that to say, by the way, uh, in one essence, even though you're adults, you also are part of that, you're children of God. 
and that the church also needs to be concerned. And that's why St. Paul is saying that, yeah, the one who was troubling you, the one that was stirring the pot, the one that was causing divisions among you, they will bear that penalty. Uh, just like those that take advantage of little ones, they will bear that penalty. So I don't mean to um, say that, you know, kids are fair game by all means, no. Uh, they do need to be protected, loved, nurtured, uh, prayed for, uh, taught, uh, but also so do adults. And the church as, as a whole has a responsibility that also says, we're gonna try to raise up really good leaders, okay, within the church and try to teach them, try to uh, watch what they believe, what they teach, what they do, just for a little bit of a better accountability. Nothing wrong with a little extra accountability, especially since, oh, by the way, we even saw this in the days of uh, St. Paul. But let's go on to verse 11. But if I, brothers, still preached circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Okay, now I will admit this is a taken, seems like it's almost taken a little bit out of context here. Uh, so let me uh, bring Luther in to help uh, get us refocused here. But basically the point that St. Paul is trying to make is, okay, you know, you were, um, the, the, the people of Galatians got stirred up, they got caught up in this whole concept of circumcision, uh, and the, the false apostles were doing a lot of picking on St. Paul and saying, don't pay attention to St. Paul. And now let's um, bring in Luther here. So uh, Luther is basically writing, he says, referring to St. Paul, I brought upon myself the bitterness, bitter hatred and the persecution of the high priests. And because of the people and of my entire nation, uh, because I deny that circumcision brings righteousness. If I attributed righteousness to circumcisions, the Jews would not only lie in ambush for, for me, but even praise and love me extravagantly. But now, because I preach the gospel of Christ and the righteousness of faith, together with the abrogation of the law and circumcision, I suffer persecution. Now, what St. Paul is trying to say is, wait a minute, folks, take a look at what's happening to me. He is still being persecuted by the religious leaders, very similar to like Jesus was, okay? And so St. Paul is basically saying, wait a minute, my own nation is kind of going against me, okay? And so that's why he is continuing to keep his focus upon Christ. So let me just back up to that verse again. He says, but if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In the case of the offense of the cross, in that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. So basically, St. Paul is kind of making that argument, I'm not preaching circumcision. This is why I am being persecuted, because we are teaching the faith correctly. So again, to follow the grace of Christ. I just want to go back to that Luther quote because... There might be a misunderstanding of one of the words that Luther uses. Going to the word, uh, together with the uh, abrogation of uh, the law and circumcision. Okay, so St. Paul is not saying let's remove the law. When you look up the dictionary uh, definition here, uh, abrogation is more of a suppression, not necessarily a removal. You could have it as a removal, but it's really more of a, a suppression because as St. Paul will note and as uh, Jesus himself notes, Christ came to fulfill the law, okay? So just as a little bit of a clarification because sometimes when you pull quotes out of context, uh, you, you might lose the initial thought. You might be going, wait a minute. I thought St. Paul was reminding us that the law is good. It doesn't save us, but we can use it as a guide. And the answer is, that's correct. Any questions about the Luther quote? Yeah, question. Uh, it sounds like he's giving an example, uh, explaining why he's suffering persecution. 
but he didn't just suffer persecution only because he did not preach circumcision. He preached Christ. Yeah. It was the major persecution. Exactly. Yeah. And so the world is constantly going after Christ. You're right. Uh, but uh, the... The, 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 and I, so yes, I agree with you uh, on that, is that ultimately the reason why he was being persecuted was because of the Christian faith. And so he, he was kind of almost using that as an argument that says, hey, look, the world around me is persecuting me. So you know I gotta be on the right track, okay? Jesus himself even says, you know, if the world hates you, good. It hated me first, okay? Not that we should go around trying to stir up hatred from the world, but we should always keep our focus on Christ and not be surprised if we inflict the wrath of the world because the world does not know Christ. So likewise, there's another argument that is out there that says that the world really loves you. Sorry, I do have in the back of my mind with that statement, maybe some TV evangelists that are extremely well respected by the world and everyone looks up to them then maybe they're not preaching Christ because the world will not really love you if you are preaching Christ and him crucified. Let's go on to uh, verse 12. <laughs> Paul's going to be really uh, uh, frank with this one. Uh, verse 12, I wish those who unsettled you would emasculate themselves. Okay, this is a little bit of St. Paul humor here. Uh, basically, he's, uh, they were promoting circumcision so much and trusting the law so much that St. Paul is just going to just be out and he's frustrated with them and that they, they left the law, they, they've left Christ to follow the law and he's trying to settle them down and he's just basically saying to those that stirred you up, I wish that, you know, if they're so happy about cutting off a little piece of skin, why don't they just be so happier and cut it all off? <laughs> That's kind of the St. Paul humor here at this point. Um, so let, let's uh, grab Luther here for a moment. Uh, Luther writes, Is this proper for an apostle? Not only to declare that the false apostles are troublemakers, to condemn them and to hand them over to the devil, but to even call evil upon, down upon them and to wish that they would perish and be utterly destroyed. In other words, to curse them. It seems to me that Paul is making an allusion to circumcision as though he were saying, they are forcing you to be circumcised. I wish they themselves would be mutilated to the very foundation and root. Yeah, okay. So you, you're kind of seeing that frustration there from St. Paul here. It shows his humanity. And that's also a very important thing to realize. Because as we read scripture, okay, and we realize that God called these various <clears throat> authors to proclaim God's word, each author has their own personality, right? And God can use that personality in proclaiming that word of God. Just like each pastor has their own different style of preaching and teaching. Not necessarily to say one pastor is ten times better than another pastor. It's just a different style as long as they are proclaiming Christ. That's always the key. If they stop proclaiming Christ, now we got into a problem. Okay. Um, I always like to see more Christ in messages. The more Christ, the better. Uh, but I will admit some of uh, some brothers uh, do like to go with other type of messages and get a little bit of Christ in there. So I always wince a little bit and going more Christ is always better. But um, Christ is always the key. But you're right. They, St. Paul is showing he is a human being. And we need to realize that St. Paul is a sinner, just like your pastor is a sinner, okay? Uh, St. Paul can get angry, just like pastors can get angry, okay? Uh, St. Paul can make mistakes, just like pastors can make mistakes. 
Now, to be fair, pastors should be raised up or should hold themselves accountable to a higher level, as we started off the, with that, uh, especially along the teaching. Uh, and if they are not, what happens if a pastor really makes a mistake? Unfortunately, then our church does have to step in and say, guess what? We don't think you're qualified to be a pastor anymore. Yes, there's forgiveness of sins from Christ, but unfortunately, we've had to remove professional church workers in our midst. And it's a very painful process, not only for the district president who has to do that, uh, but then also even for the community of believers that have suffered that pain and that frustration in watching things unravel. And so uh, we, we do this very carefully, and St. Paul is going to allude to that uh, in a few more verses, is that when you have to do that type of correction, because that's kind of what St. Paul is kind of doing, he's trying to put the pieces back together again, we need to be careful because we may stumble ourselves, and St. Paul is going to allude to that really quickly. But let's continue on here. Verse 13, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another. So what does St. Paul mean by you have a freedom? Well, that's why I'm bringing in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Basically, your sins are forgiven. Okay? You have that freedom, and St. Paul says, use that freedom to love one another. You don't have to worry about appeasing God. Jesus has already taken care of that for you. You are good. You are loved. You are forgiven. So instead of using all that energy to sit there and say, I, I got to follow the law perfectly. No, Christ has done that for you. Then start using that energy to serve your neighbor in need. So let's go to verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. So again, St. Paul wants to very clearly make the point. Christ Jesus has already died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. We rejoice in that justification. That justification is the basis of our church. This is what we believe, teach, and confess. Okay. And yes, we should learn more about it. Fair enough but we also should be loving our neighbor. Let me grab uh, Luther here. But this is what he now requires of you, that you believe in Christ, whom he himself has sent, then you will be made perfect in him and will have everything. Now, if to faith, the worship that is most pleasing to God, you want to add laws, then you should know that in this brief commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, all laws are included. Strive to observe this commandment, for if you observe it, you will fulfill all the laws. So again, notice where Luther is setting you. Number one is Christ. You believe and trust in Jesus Christ. Yep. Uh, that's the focus of our church. That's the focus of our worship, the justification by grace through faith. Yep. And then you should know that, uh, and if you want to add laws, let me say that his, his comment here, if you want to add laws, you, you got a little bit more extra energy. That's kind of the way I've been uh, teaching this. You, you've been studying God's word. Uh, you've been grow, uh, learning more about God's word. You got more extra energy that you want to put this into action. Where do you put this into action? Not by taking Jesus off the cross? Nope. You put this into action by serving your neighbor in need. Yeah, John. Do the laws make you kind? Do the laws make you kind? I love that as a question. I'm going to answer it and say no. It's the love of Christ. God first loves us. And because we are changed by God's grace through faith, we then in turn can love one another. Okay? But does that happen by the law? No. It happens by God's grace, that gospel message. Beautiful question. Thank you for adding that. Okay, verse uh, 15. 
But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Okay, so again, that goes back to that whole concept of this, this chapter heading, uh, section heading, that focused on how, you know, if you're going to be really following the law and you're trying to justify yourself, you're not building that community. Okay? And so likewise, if you are constantly at ends, at enmity with one another, you are biting and devouring one, one another, watch out, guess what? You're going to consume yourselves in that uh, anger and frustration. So picking up Luther here, with these words, Paul testifies there can be no peace or concord in the churches, either in thought or in life, if the foundation, notice, if the foundation, that is the doctrine of faith, is undermined by wicked teachers, but that immediately there will arise some dissension and notion uh, or other doctrine, faith, and works. Once the concord of the church has been violated, there is neither limit nor end to this evil. So this is what St. Paul is, and Luther is trying to teach us. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We have that love. We have that forgiveness, justification by grace through faith. It's the solid foundation of the church. Because we have that great foundation, we can then take the extra energy that we have and go serve our neighbor in need. However, if somebody disrupts that foundation, if someone tries to break apart Christ or pull Christ off the cross and say, no, your, forg your sins are not completely forgiven, or you got to do this instead or do that instead, Notice it's going to take our energy away from serving our neighbor in need and put it the wrong direction because somebody destroyed that foundation. So we always need to protect that foundation and say, wait a minute, we always need to teach we are saved by God's grace through faith. You might be thinking, but pastor, every one of the pastors here at Peace have always proclaimed that to us. And the answer is yes, because if that foundation is broken, we will fall apart. So that is the foundation. That is the most important thing. And upon that foundation, then we can do more. But not in place of that foundation. John? I might have thought that uh, the doctrine is just, it's more than just words. It's our You're right, it's more than just words, it's our security. Without that doctrine, without that justification by grace through faith, we would wander off in so many bad ways. And so that's why St. Paul, in rebuilding the, the people, is saying, yes, this is the most important thing. And we're going to build upon that foundation of Christ or else we are really in trouble. I have one more aspect of... Um, Luther here. It is difficult and dangerous to teach that we are justified by faith without works and yet require works at the same time. Unless the ministers of Christ are faithful and prudent here and are stewards of the mysteries of God, from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, who rightly divide the word of truth, from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, they will immediately confuse faith and love at this point. Both topics, faith and works, must be carefully taught and emphasized, but in such a way that they both remain within their limits. Otherwise, if works alone are taught, as happens, happened under the papacy, faith is lost. If faith alone is taught, unspiritual men will immediately uh, suppose that works are not necessary. So Luther very clearly sets the stage that says, yes, we are saved by God's grace through faith. Justification by faith is the foundation of the church. Are good works necessary? Yes, they will flow from that foundation to other people. 
Any questions about that before we, yeah, John? Was Luther the only one that brought this out in, in, in his doctrine? Mm -hmm. he, well, at, at this time, remember Luther is in the, the, uh, the 1500s. The, the, the church at that time was very much consumed with um, a lot of externals. A lot of raising of money to help uh, build uh, the cathedrals. Um, and Luther was trying to say, wait a minute, this is important. We need to return to this beautiful gospel message uh, that we are saved by God's grace through faith. And this is the foundation. And it's through that foundation that we can serve our neighbor in need. It's, it's tough because our sinful nature wants to react this way. And I've even heard it even in today's world, okay, which goes like this. I've already heard that Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. Pastor, why do I need to hear that every week? Can't we go on to some more important topics, more relevant topics, more topics to make me feel better, to live a better life, or to do this or to do that? Guess what? Those battles are still going on today. So Luther was not the first one to do this and to teach this. Uh, I would say St. Paul was also one of the first ones to do this, but Scripture is constantly giving us this message we, not, we need to continue to put our faith and trust in Christ. And through Christ, we can serve our neighbor and need both. But Christ has got to be number one. Because if you lose this foundation of Christ, then all is lost. Unfortunately, because we live in a sinful world with even sinful pastors like me, uh, we sometimes get that message a little confused. And so Luther is trying to encourage the pastors because in case if you didn't know, even during the time of Luther, not all pastors were correctly teaching. Luther would go do a visitation, okay, uh, as the Reformation was continuing on, just to go visit the state of the parishes that were around him. Guess what he found? He was appalled. Okay, that's why he wrote the catechisms. Okay, uh, because he's sitting there going, I can't believe what these pastors are teaching. They need to be instructed. Okay, uh, likewise, uh, our, our church, uh, uh, and some of you may know this, uh, uh, we also have uh, what we call circuit visitors. We actually use that term visitors because we want them. Uh, they're sort of like a, a pastor that is sort of somewhat shepherding or it, looking over like eight or so congregations in our area under the authority of the district president because the district president can't always be out there encouraging and trying to teach and trying to uh, lift up and to work with these congregations. And the reason why I named that is we have a circuit visitor. Um, He's chosen not to continue in that position because it is a volunteer position. And um, I got elected for that and that'll be ratified at the next uh, district convention. Uh, and so um, I'm sitting there going, okay, a little extra responsibility, okay. But it's needed because we need to have our pastors and our churches to be able to work together and to keep that uh, level of accountability. So I kind of need to know what my brother pastors are teaching. Not that I'm expecting them to be going off uh, weird directions, but just to make sure that everything is okay within the, uh, the circuit churches. Uh, as our current circuit pastor has been a very good mentor, even for me, uh, now it'll be kind of a little bit of my opportunity to help mentor some of the, uh, the other pastors and to mentor him back, which again is a good thing. Uh, so that should be coming up uh, sometime this next year, and you'll be hearing a little bit more about that, uh, uh, just because it does uh, affect some of the, the duties and some of my time here at Peace. But let's uh, move on to the next section. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to go back to where you are talking about, um, Paul was talking about that he was being attacked all the time right. people hated him mm -hmm. and yet he had faith and love and trust in God mm -hmm. 
okay, and you preach Christ. And then you spoke about people who are not following that path and they kind of attack one another and devour one mm -hmm. another. And so I see conflict in either side. Sure. However, the difference that I see is that if you have faith and trust in God, that He is our protector. Mm -hmm. He is the one that will save us. Even right. though, because like he says, I was persecuted when I came on earth. And so if I was persecuted and you're following me, you're going to be persecuted. So I guess I just wanted to remind myself in a way is that when we're going through really bad times and we think, why am I being attacked when I'm following God? Why do so many people dislike me? You know, I, at least I feel like they dislike me when I'm trying to follow God. And then if you say, well, if I didn't follow God and I went to the other side, and well, they're going to attack you, but they devour their own, though. There's no, there's no one saying, well, we're going to love you and we're going to you know, protect you and we're going to forgive you. There, they just devour their own. Where we know that we are with God, God is our protector. He, it stands, he doesn't condemn us. He forgives us. And he supports us. I, I see that as the difference, even though we may be attacked on either side. Well, and I appreciate the as you're you're noting the conflict. Okay, that even in the quote unquote non Christian world, there's still conflict. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're right. The conflict is just not um, uh, particular to the Christian world. We live in a world of a lot of conflict. And so I want you to consider one thing. So I'm agreeing with you 100%. You're just giving me another opportunity to do some more teaching, so I'm springing board on, the, on that one. And when God created everything, it was perfect. It was in order. There was no conflict. Who was the one that stirred the pot, so to speak? Who was the one that created that conflict? Who was the one that lives to continue to create conflict? The one that crawled along. Yeah, Satan himself. Yes, thank you, John. Uh, and so, yes, we do see Satan alive in this world. And that is actually, you could say, uh, Jesus described Satan as the father of uh, lies. Okay, fair enough. I, I liked what, uh, what one seminary professor uh, described Satan as. He described Satan as the chaos monster. The one who just wants to continue to bring chaos into God's beautiful order of creation. And he will bring chaos into the government. Remember the three estates of Luther? The government, the church, and the family. Okay? And so, yeah, he's the father of lies. But how does he... What's kind of behind all of that? He just wants to create chaos. He wants to create disorder because we have a God of order. When you look at the creation, it was ordered. Light separated from darkness. Water separated from the land. Uh, you, you have all these orders and things done in the right time and place. We have a God of order. And Satan is rebelling against God. So how does Satan want to work? Chaos. Conflict. And so, um, yeah, we'll see that within the church. But we're also going to see that out in the world. And we shouldn't be surprised. Yes, that's until we get to the new heavens and the new earth of being with Christ in paradise. Yeah, uh, we're going to be living in that conflict. But yeah, thank you for bringing that up just as a beautiful reminder. Conflict is not just in the church. It's in the church because Satan's attacks on the church, but it's also very much in the world. Okay, so let me go on to um, uh, this next section as we have, uh, as it's kind of labeled uh, the second argument about living as a justified person. And now he's going to be looking at the fruits of the flesh and the one fruit of the Spirit. And this section is going to be titled, The Community Living by the Flesh is Divided. Okay, so if we're going to be living by the flesh, by our sinful nature, we will be divided. Okay, and that's not necessarily, notice the next one is, the community living by the Spirit is united. 
So basically, St. Paul is going to be presenting these two little arguments. Do you want to be living by the flesh? You're going to be divided. Join the chaos monster. But if, you want, if you're living by the spirit, you're going to be united. So let's uh, dive into this. Verse 16. But I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Oh, so St. Paul here is kind of naming that internal struggle going on. I like to teach this in my junior high confirmation classes like a tug of war. Because they, they, they kind of remember those type of games where you have one side tugging one way, one side tugging another way. And the Spirit is indeed tugging us toward Christ. Our human sinful nature is also tugging us away from Christ. So yeah, there's a spiritual uh, battle going on even within us. And so what is St. Paul saying? Walk by the Spirit. Give energy, focus your energy to Christ and His Word, not to the desires of the flesh. Those are two different things. So I bring in a very interesting quote. It's one of my favorite quotes uh, from Luther, not on his lecture in Galatians. Okay, this, I'm deviating from that for a moment. Uh, from the large catechism in reference to the Lord's Supper. Okay. He, he writes, we must never regard the sacrament, and that's again ref reference to the Lord's Supper, as a harmful thing from which we should flee, but as a pure, wholesome, soothing medicine that aids you and gives life in both soul and body. For where the soul is healed, the body is helped as well. Why then do we act as if the sacrament were a poison? that it would kill us if we ate of it. Okay, again, one of my favorite Luther quotes coming out of the large catechism here, uh, Lord's Sup uh, section of the Lord's Supper. So Luther is making the following point, is that we, we shouldn't be fleeing from Christ, obviously, nor the means by which Christ has given to us to strengthen us in these daily struggles. But to realize, especially in regards to the, the Lord's Supper, it, it is a soothing medicine uh, that gives us life, and Luther's going to add the, the aspect of body and soul. And the way he's going to bring this in, he says, for where the soul is healed, the body is helped as well. Now, he's not going to sit there and say, you, you, you go up to the Lord's Supper and you're going to be cured of cancer. You go up to the Lord's Supper and you'll no longer have to take insulin. You go up to the Lord's Supper and that broken rib you have is now healed. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is that when the soul is healed, you hear that forgiveness of sins. You know that you're loved and cherished by God. Guess what? The body is also helped. Okay? Uh, and then he, he asks the question, then why do we sometimes think of the sacrament as a poison? Now, you're probably sitting there going, why is he saying that? And the answer is, you're, you might be asking that question because you guys are regular attenders here. I want you to think in the back of your mind of those people that you haven't seen in months, maybe even years, who are purposefully distancing themselves from peace or being distracted from the, by the world around them. Why are they acting like the sacrament which we offer at every single worship service. It doesn't matter what time we have it offered so that they would have this healing. Why do they act like this is a poison? I don't want to go anywhere near a Peace Lutheran Church in Plainfield. Yeah, hold on. At the same time, if one believes that the host is the actual body and blood of Christ. Amen. And there is healing yep. in that host. Yep. Why 
would anyone keep someone, even though we know they're sinners, because we're, we're all sinners, mm -hmm. but some might be a little bit worse than others, or because we don't follow the exact traditions of the church, why are those kept from the healing body, healing host of God? Kept from receiving it. I, I love the question you ask. Because that was actually one of the bases. I don't know if uh, you, you I, I know that you, you can't, got connected to peace after I've already came here, but one of the first changes I made here, for those of you who are long term members and you know, was we started celebrating the sacrament at every single service. Why? Because I wanted to make sure it was offered. Just in case somebody does get, wants to get reconnected, why would I not want to offer it? especially when it does bring that forgiveness of sins. And I will admit, for Lutherans, we don't always like to change. And uh, I know this is the second parish that I've kind of walked through that change with. And as we start those changes, you know, some people are on board right away and some people are a little bit more resilient. Uh, but what's behind all of this is, again, uh, that aspect of saying here is Christ himself bringing us his body, his blood, forgiveness of sin, strengthening our faith, it even helps our body. Why would we want to say no? And th the answer to that question, uh, to be fair, that some people have said is because we were never taught or we were never had that explained to us that way. Well, it's now being explained. And now we are celebrating the Lord's Supper at every single service. So uh, that, that is uh, very uh, true, but it's part of the, here's the reason I brought this quote in here. It's part of that struggle we have with our human flesh, okay? Is that our human sinful nature doesn't necessarily want to be always attached to the things of God. So now when we bring the sacrament of Christ's body and blood, the Lord's Supper, at every single service, yeah, it's going to be a little bit of a change. And yeah, there might be a little bit of a tension. And where is all that coming from? Yeah, we are sinners. And we just got to fess up to that. And yes, we realize that struggle. And that's why St. Paul does a beautiful job in naming it. And we shouldn't be afraid to name that within us there is a struggle, okay? Uh, but instead to uh, keep our energy focused that we realize the war within us, then we need to be around God's word and sacrament. But again, as that last question asks, why do we act like it's a poison that would kill us and avoid it? The answer is, yeah, we're still struggling with that sin. John? I believe you. Before we receive our communion, you always tell us in memory of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And this to me is very important. Okay. As well as we receive it, supposedly we do receive the body and blood of Christ. But the important thing is that the memory of God's sacrifice is occurring. It, it, I know it's only once that it occurred. But it's the memory you remind us of. Yeah, because whenever we receive Christ's body and blood, we are re remembering uh, uh, his atonement, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and as, and as the liturgy also says, even his coming again. And so it does refocus us back to Christ <laughs> and all the things that Christ has done for us and will still do for us. And it is a, a blessed thing because whenever you keep your focus on Christ, you're keeping it the right direction. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just a little confused. Okay. So can someone who isn't a Missouri Synod person take communion here in this church? Okay, so... Yeah, I couldn't take it for two years. Yeah, I, that, that... I was very upset because mm -hmm. I felt that I was being denied the body of Christ. Now, each pastor, I will admit, uh, will do things a little bit differently, okay? So I don't want to, I don't know exactly which pastor that was and what was all the reasonings for it, 
but let me show you how I want to uh, teach things. First of all, is I always want to make sure the correct teaching that this is Christ's body and blood, okay? Because not all de denominations would teach that. And this is exactly what St. Paul very clearly articulates in 1 Corinthians. It is the body and blood of Christ. And it is present with that bread and wine. So I always like to say there's four things present. The bread, the wine, the body, and blood of Christ. And we receive all four things. But not all churches teach that. And, and so we do want to do that teaching. And we should want to encourage, especially when, you know, couples get married, that as one spouse is coming, that the next spouse also also comes to church and to, to do that type of instruction right away. Uh, so my apologies that it took two years um, it, to do that instruction more sooner than later because from my point of view as a pastor, I would I love to see husband and wife gathering together in the pews together and worshiping together. And whenever they're not, I will admit there's, there's always a little bit of angst within me because I don't want to, the church to divide husband and wife. I want to try to keep husband and wife united because as we were talking about earlier, Satan is the one that always wants to try to divide us. And Satan will use any means possible to divide us, even the <clears throat> Lord's Supper. Guess what? We have Christian denominations, and what's one of the major things that kind of divide us as denominations mm -hmm. in the United States and throughout the world? <coughs> Lord's Supper, <coughs> baptism, Word of God, and these are very precious things to us. So we don't want to be divided just, and just like that, and just the opposite. We want to reach out and to gather uh, people together, but at the same time, we're also not going to diminish what God's Word teaches and what we teach. So the I don't know why it took two years, okay, and I'm sorry it took two years. Well, you uh, had to take instruction. It was yeah. long, like a year. It was such a long, it's a long time. It, you know, it is a long time. Um, and I, not that I want to try to shortcut any of that, but I also understand the importance of why uh, couples need to, to come together and uh, not be divided on that. And so I always like to try to tackle a lot of those things, especially the Lord's Supper part, uh, in a, a quicker time frame, just so that maybe we can, because like what we do with the junior high confirmants, we do early communion. Okay, that's part of the tradition here at Peace. Uh, I didn't have that in my previous parish, but that's part of this tradition here, so let's just go ahead and keep that tradition. So we do early communion, and then they finish up their confirmation. And the, I would approach that very similarly, uh, especially for adult confirmation, especially if I have uh, one spouse who's attending uh, and another spouse who's just receiving a blessing, I really don't want that person to wait. And so that invitation is saying, hey, let's go through the classes, let's learn more, because the greatest joy for me is when I would see a husband and wife communing together. And so I always want to kind of bring that up. Oh, Linda, yes, please. Even as one spouse is in heaven mm -hmm. and the other one is communing at the altar, they're still together at the Ooh. table of the Lord. Amen. Now you're bringing in the nuance of the mystical body of Christ. Yes. Amen. And, and I will admit, that's, that's uh, I could talk forever on that one. Okay. So the fact that I have about five minutes left, <laughs> that's a little unfair. So I'm, I'm trying to resist. Otherwise, you're going to be here until about two o'clock. Um, but you got to remember that it, our loved ones are in Christ. And who are, who are believers, and Christ is present in the bread and the wine. And we, we, we use the phrase, the mystical body of Christ, because we're sitting there going, how are all these connections being made? And it's beyond us. But yet at the same time, it's comforting to us that, as Linda pointed out, even if my loved one is now with Christ, I go up for communion and we're still communing together as a couple. It's a beautiful theology of bringing comfort and joy. So, yeah, I don't know, Mary, did you, did I answer your question or address your concerns or? 
yeah, each pastor is going to do things a little bit differently, and I don't want to. You no, know, it's just that you have to believe a certain way. In order yeah. To get communion right. Here. Exactly. Is we want to make sure everyone's on the same page because this is so important to us. Because, again, this is what kind of divides. Um, let me give you one other illustration. Um, so I would do a, a baptism of a young child. Okay, parents would bring the, the child to the baptismal font. We do the baptism and so forth online. It's all great. It's all wonderful. Uh, maybe a job location later on in life and so forth. They are no longer worshiping here but elsewhere. And the church that they got attached to said, oh, no, that child wasn't properly baptized. It was baptized as an infant. You got to be baptized as an adult. And then all of a sudden, the child is being rebaptized. Well, you have to be baptized submerged in water. Yeah, and now all of a sudden, it's just like, well, wait a minute here, folks. What's going on here? There are differences. <coughs> or even better yet, one, one of my uh, other little examples to this is I did a wedding ceremony for a couple. Okay. Uh, he was Lutheran, she was Roman Catholic, okay, nothing wrong with that, okay, uh, let's gather, let's do the wedding ceremony. Uh, because of a lot of other interesting things and dynamics, I, I found out through the family that, oh, by the way, Pastor Ball, hopefully you're not offended, um, the wedding ceremony was redone in the Catholic Church. And I'm sitting there going, okay, okay. And, and so we want to stick with God's word. And that's why we also need to t continue to teach because it is important. And we have to realize there are differences, especially with how you handle and treat God's word, which also then brings those differences into how you handle and treat the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And yeah, we live in a world where Satan is doing a really good job in dividing us. And so we need to continue to teach what God's word teaches. And St. Paul will say, <clears throat> and actually it is in the slide, but you're going to have to probably wait for about three weeks to get it. <laughs> so my apologies. Um, where where St. Paul is going to say, you're going to have to test and you're going to have to examine yourself. Uh, he's going to say that in Galatians. And that same Greek word is also utilized in how St. Paul says, yes, this also applies to the Lord's Supper. Okay, I think that's in Galatians chapter 6, and which also is a beautiful reminder that the, uh, uh, the next two weeks on Thursdays, I won't be here. So you're going to have to kind of remember all of this for three weeks from now. Okay, so just to forewarn you about that. But that, that's coming up in this letter also that says we do need to test we do need to examine because this is so precious that if you make a dent in that foundation, you put a crack in that foundation, it's not as strong as it used to be. And so that's one of the things as Missouri Synod Lutherans, we're, we're very, very protective of God's word and that foundation because once you uh, get cracks into it and then you start leveraging those cracks and pushing on those cracks, things fall apart and that's what we don't want to have happen yes john aren't we talking about god's miracles we're surrounded by all of god's miracles a good friday happens to be the miracle that god gave us so that we can have this conversation right right and uh, i see it as god's miracle uh and holy communion is. and when we go up there and receive it it is. It's one of God's greatest miracles. And you just made that beautiful connection to Holy Week from why we need to continue to celebrate Monday, Thursday, mm -hmm. the Lord's Supper, and Good Friday, and kind of attach those two together, along with three days later seeing the resurrection of our Lord. Oh, yeah, that's a, a, you're right on the right track there, John, for why Holy Week is such, such a, a, a wonderful uh, time to gather around God's word and sacraments and to appreciate all that God has done for us. And by the way, just to give you a little bit of the foretaste of the feast to come, 
that's why we also celebrate the birth of Jesus, because we know how it's going to end. So let me just end with one little story I heard from uh, one of our circuit pastors. And as he was trying to do some teaching about the birth of Jesus, he tried this many years ago. Uh, and trying to remind us that, yes, the, the birth of Jesus is important because God takes on flesh and blood for a reason. And that is to go to the cross. And so as a, a visual, uh, while he is preaching, he, he takes like 30 coins and tosses it in the crush with the baby Jesus, okay? And, you know, all of us pastors are sitting there going, oh, wow, what a neat visual point that says, yes, the baby Jesus, God takes on flesh and blood for a purpose. And that purpose is to die on the cross. The rest of the story. The elders kind of go up to him afterwards and they weren't happy. And he begs the question, he's like, would you rather have me put up uh, happy birthday balloons around the crash? And they said, yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay, welcome to the tension between the spirit and our human sinful nature. A very wise and patient pastor, he's just like, okay, let me kind of work through that. You know, the rest of us pastors around the table are sitting there going, what a beautiful is illustration. I can't wait until I can try to teach this or make this point. And then he says, oh, by the way, yeah, guess what? My elders didn't quite appreciate it. They would rather have the happy birthday balloons around the crash. And I'm like, ugh, yes. So it's an ongoing time of being patient, but yet saying we still need to maintain our commitment to God's word and continue to teach it. And yes, as we're teaching it, not everyone's going to come on board right away, but we still continue to teach because in that emphasis of God's word, is our salvation. So we're going to continue to teach the incarnation of Jesus. God takes on flesh and blood for the purpose. I probably won't be throwing 30 uh, coins into the crash, okay? But for the purpose of seeing our Savior die on Calvary's cross for the forgiveness of our sins. You're right, John, this is the greatest miracle. So why don't we close with that and we close with the, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.